Uh, today with us is Dr. David Steiger for his grand rounds on advances and controversies in the management of pulmonary embolism. Dr. Steiger received his medical degree from Leeds Medical School in the UK. He completed his postgraduate training and chief residency at St. Luke's Hospital, followed by pulmonary critical care fellowship at UCSF. He continued his career at NYU Medical Center, where he served as ICU director of the hospital for joint diseases and was the recipient of many teaching awards. Dr. Steiger became the chief of pulmonary critical care at Mount Sinai Beth Israel in 2015 and recently assumed the same role at Mount Sinai West. He has done both clinical and basic science research and has developed a particular expertise on multiple facets of thromboembolic disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Steiger. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me here. It's an honor to be here. And so thanks for that introduction. So the title of my talk is Advances and Controversies in the Management of Pulmonary Embolism. I'll start off with some epidemiology to frame the, my lecture over the next 45 minutes, uh, and then I'll give you an overview of where we're going to go. Um, so just some basic numbers. More than 900,000 patients are diagnosed in the U.S. annually approximately 300,000 deaths, and we know that's an underestimate because of our notoriously uh, low autopsy rate. It's the third leading cause of cardiovascular death in the United States. It is possibly responsible for at least 5 to 10 percent, and it's being described as the most common preventable cause of death in hospitals. The most important thing to remember in the next 45 minutes is timely diagnostic testing is essential, and indeed, if your pretest probability is high, you should empirically treat these patients. You should initiate anticoagulation in the absence of any absolute contraindications. And indeed, if that is done, PE mortality rate may be relatively small. Let's expand the epidemiological data and look at the global incidence and trends in global incidence. So the annual incidence varies, but at least 75 to 270 cases per 100,000. This is studies from South America, Western Europe, and Australasia. But more importantly, as one gets older, that incidence increases. With an increasing aging population, uh, globally, we are all going to see more thromboembolic disease. And before I start the main body of the lecture, I just finish with this graph here, which shows an, an exponential relationship between increasing age and the annual incidence. This is from Olmsted County in Minnesota. And actually, from age 20 to age 80, there's approximately 200-fold increase in VTE. Another way of looking at this graph is that if you're age 20 or less, it's very unusual for you to see a patient with a th uh, thromboembolic disease. And if you see it, they're probably thrombophilic. So I had the honor of meeting Ken Moser, who was one of the gurus with respect to VTE research. And he was in UC San Diego. And I met him for an interview. And at that time, the first one of our main textbooks of respiratory medicine, Murray and Adele, had come out. And he wrote the chapter on VTE. And he started it as follows. And he's a very nice writer. The one generalization about venous thromboembolism that is free from controversy is that most aspects of this disorder are controversial. There are many reasons why venous thromboembolism kindles lively debate. Perhaps the major reason is that many unknowns persist. And uh, as I talk, uh, talk you through uh, the lecture in the next 30, 40 minutes, nothing has changed. The unwary may accept authoritative opinions as being based on a bedrock of, fa bedrock of fact, only to discover that they stand at best on pillars of sand that are being lapped by waves of new information. So obviously he enjoyed writing. <laughs> so, so that's an introduction. So we talked about epidemiology, some statistics, and uh, the revered Ken Moses' thoughts about controversy in management, and nothing has changed. So in the next 40 minutes, this is an overview of where we're going to go. How do I identify the majority of patients who have PE, who are hemodynamically stable, who nevertheless, so many of them are at risk of clinical deterioration? How should we use established prediction tools and new prediction tools, which I'll share with you, in evolving literature. And here focus on the role of goal-directed echocardiography, which um, is um, are used at uh, Beth Israel as it is here. The role of the pulmonary embolism response team. I'll give you some examples of cases we manage almost every day. And um, how having an assembled multidisciplinary team will help us manage these controversial uh, management issues. And then I'll highlight the, the current state of the literature, which is not great, 
there's a lack of randomized control studies on the role of thrombolytics, catheter-directed thrombolysis, ECMO, and open embolectomy in patients who are hemodynamically stable but with um, um, RV dysfunction and those with massive PE. And if we have time, I'll highlight the controversies and trying to understand what is the actual prevalence of PE in patients who are admitted with COPD and uh, some research we've been doing on pulmonary infarction that was just accepted. So as clinicians, so let's go. Uh, as clinicians, we might suspect a patient has a pulmonary embolism. So we use clinical prediction tools, as you know, and most of us use the Wells criteria. Most of us have a, a basic understanding of what they are without an explicit uh, recall. And we don't go straight for CT angiography because if we use clinical prediction tools properly, only about 20% of our patients should have a pulmonary embolism. And a CT angiography is not without morbidity and potential mortality. So, if a patient's of high pretest probability, we should do a CT angiogram. We'll, we'll focus on this theme in a minute. If our pretest probability is low or intermediate and the D dimer is negative, the negative predictive value in predicting a PE is about 98, 99%. And you can send these patients home with, with probable security. Uh, if the D dimer is positive, you're obligated to do a CT angiography. Understanding the D dimer elevation may be nonspecific, and we see it elevated in trauma in hospitalized patients and in the elderly. So a CT angiography is done, and we have diagnosed a pulmonary embolism. I'm now going to go through two basic clinical prediction tools that we all use, and then I'm going to augment that with discussing four new ones, because you'll see that our clinical prediction tools that I'm going to describe in a minute have very poor positive predictive value. First of all, let's uh, talk about the PESI score. So we have diagnosed a pulmonary embolism, and then we define the patient's 30-day mortality as characterized by the PESI score. The PESI score was described, derived, and validated in an article in 2005 in our most important pulmonary journal. And simply speaking, uh, there is a weighted clinical criteria, um, and the more points one has, the you are assigned to a higher class. So whereas you are at low risk of 30-day mortality, if your PESI score um, uh, puts you in class one or two, where your mortality rate would be from zero to 3.5%. And indeed, that low score is used to define a low-risk patient who may go home within 24 hours. Conversely, if you're in classes three to five, you're at increased risk of 30-day overall mortality, not PE-specific mortality. So there are 11 scores, uh, 11 variables here the simplified PESI reduces the number of weighted criteria from 11 to 6. Age, cancer, comorbid heart and or lung disease, tachycardia, hypotension, hypoxemia. Okay. So the second prognostic tool we use over and above the PESI score is the uh, score system uh, devised by the, uh, uh, the American Society of Cardiology. And this is a landmark review in 2014. We're expecting the 2018 update. So if a patient is, in, uh, is low risk, if the PESI score is less than three to five, and they are not in shock. We're gonna be focusing most of our lecture on the, these patients' intermediate risk and how to de, uh, define who is at increased risk of mortality. So. The ESC um, defined patients intermediate risk, low risk, if they are not in shock, but they have an advanced PESI score three to five, and they have either elevated biomarkers, a manifestation of RV dysfunction, BMP or troponin, or an increased RV by echo or CT scan. And the patient is at intermediate high risk if you have both elevated biomarkers and an, and an increased RV on the echo and or CT scan. At the very end, we'll talk about the very high-risk patients and the evidence supporting different forms of therapy. And these are patients who are in shock or in high PESI class. So if the patient's intermediate high risk, we have a number of uh, therapies that one could consider using. And in the next few minutes, we'll look at the evidence supporting the role of so-called reperfusion therapy in these patients at intermediate high risk, those are the positive PE who have an elevated PESI score, who have both RV dysfunction by biomarkers and an increased RV size by echo and or CT scan. 
We should remember that most of our patients who present are hemodynamically stable, but 40% have evidence of RV dysfunction. It's possible that up to two-thirds of patients presenting to our ERs are at low risk, who could conceivably be discharged in 24 hours. And there's a lot of liter evolving literature on early discharge because not only to improve patient satisfaction, but it's been shown to be as safe as admitting patients short term and re receiving the same therapy. Indeed, the advent of DOAX certainly facilitates the early discharge of patients. So the risk prediction tools we've already described, the PESI score and the ESC guidelines. Let me enlighten you with some new uh, prediction scores shortly. The problem is as follows. So this is a table from the European Heart Journal, and we talked about CT angiography, biomarkers, BMP and troponin, and echocardiography. They all have a significantly elevated sensitivity, but the problem here, which is the platform for discussing new prognostic models, is a positive predictive value of an, L, of an abnormal echo or increased RV on the CT scan or elevated BNP and troponin is very small, less than 20%. So how are we going to define that patient who's at risk of hemodynamic instability when initially they look well? And many of you as clinicians have looked after patients who turn sour very quickly when they seem to be stable on presentation. Just a review of the literature, how do we know that uh, echo CT angiography biomarkers help predict poor outcome? Well, number one, RV hypokinesis is a much quoted study from the ICOPER study from Goldhaber. About 1,000 patients in this study had an echo within 24 hours of admission with a PE. And if you have RV hypokinesis, you have a significantly increased risk of mortality as shown in the Kaplan-Meier curve here, showing up to 30-day mortality. And similarly, an increased RV on your CT scan, where the ratio is greater, the RV to LV should be less than 0.6, where it's greater than or equal to 0.9, you have an increased 30-day mortality. And now radiologists, uh, if they use a particular uh, algorithm, can measure and compare the end diastolic volumes of the RV versus LV. And this is a normal patient, it should be less than 0.6. Here you have a significantly uh, increased end diastolic uh, di diameter of the RV compared to the RV associated with increased mortality. And in this meta-analysis, when we look at biomarkers, we see that elevations in BNP and troponin are associated with worse mortality. So now we'll, let's talk about RV function and surrogates of RV abnormalities and using that to predict who is going to deteriorate and what tools and what management tools do we have to support these patients. This has been called the spiral of death. And this is uh, created by Kostanides, who's a, a European guru with respect to VTE uh, 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 research. And so uh, mechanistically here as follows. So the patient has developed a pulmonary embolism and we know that at least 30 to 50% of the pulmonary vascular bed has to be obliterated until the patient develops pulmonary hypertension and RV dysfunction. This patient has a pulmonary embolism, develops tricuspid regurge because the dilatation, the RV, is under great tension. And that causes neurohormonal activation as a compensation, increasing epi and norepi, increased tachycardia, increased inotropy. But it creates, unfortunately, that compensatory mechanism creates further uh, oxygen demand, which cannot be met. Um, the RV becomes hypokinetic and hence decrease cardiac output because of the high pulmonary vascular resistance. And this is why patients die. With insufficient RV output because of the high pulmonary vascular resistance, there's insufficient left ventricular filling, patient's blood pressure falls, uh, decrease perfusion of the right ventricle from the hypotension, decrease oxygen delivery, and hence the patient succumbs to death. So we have to identify these patients who are at risk of this so-called so circle of death who develop cardiogenic shock, which is the cause of pulmonary embolism. So I'm just going to highlight one, two, three, four more recently described prognostic tools over and above the ones we have mentioned that may help us define this patient at risk of RV dysfunction and death. One of them is the BOVA index, uh, which is a composite of clinical and laboratory markers. The second is plasma lactate. We're all familiar as clinicians that the plas elevated plasma lactate is associated with worse prognosis in many clinical states, including sepsis. 
acute MI and trauma. And uh, an elevated lactate can be seen into, prior to the patient being hypotensive. The FAST score, this requires the use of a newly described biomarker, uh, fatty acid binding protein, heart type, um, which uh, is an early marker of myocardial ischemia, earlier than a troponin or BNP, and has a very high positive predictive value of 28% in predicting poor outcome. Um, and the last one is the estimate, which is a multi-marker prognostic model, which integrates the PESI score, elevated biomarkers, and adds the DVT. Notice that these three um, uh, prog uh, prognostic models do not um, rely on a concurrent DVT, which is associated with worse prognosis, and certainly with a PE. So firstly, the BOVA. Here, BOVA is the second author. It had previously been derived, and here it is validated. And the BOVA scoring system is as follows, and it's quite simple. You will have this information quite soon after the patient's had a CT angiography and the biomarkers are back. Two points for borderline blood pressure, two points for troponin, one point for RV dysfunction on echo or CT, uh, two points, and one for tachycardia. And so here's the story. So if you are at, you're at higher risk of P-related complications and P-related mortality, if you're in a higher class based on that BOVA score. So that ranges from 3.1% in class one to 10% in class three, using those four simple variables. Um, here's a second prognostic model that can be used, described by Vanni, and Vanni has been writing about the role or potential utility of lactate in defining a high-risk patient. It sounds simple, but he, he did the studies and he looked at 500 consecutive patients where here he's defining an abnormal lactate as a lactate of greater than or equal to two in patients who are hemodynamically stable. This is what we're talking about right now. And he shows a positive predictive value if you integrate an elevated lactate with a troponin elevation and an abnormal echo rises to 18% compared, um, another way of expressing it, increasing lactate associated with worse primary outcome. And if you add, a, and uh, this is somebody with RV dysfunction elevated opponent with a normal lactate, but look how the primary outcome worsens significantly if you add, just by simply adding an arterial lactate sample, where the clinical uh, the prediction of worsened outcome, this is at seven days, is up to 18%. Um, and finally, the, uh, the FAST, so-called FAST uh, score, which integrates the uh, fatty acid binding protein, remember it's a marker of myocardial ischemia, which is now is, a, is available as an easy to use uh, test. Adding syncope, which we know is an independent risk factor for worse outcome uh, in pulmonary embolism, acknowledging of course that there may be many more benign causes of syncope in these patients. Integrating tachycardia, and the value is, is uh, greater than or equal to three. And, yeah, and a significant proportion of these patients were sick, 54% had RV dysfunction, troponin elevation, 78% had ESC intermediate risk. These were all patients who were hemodynamically stable. And you see that the positive predictive value is much greater than the ESC model, which we described at the beginning, or the simplified PESI, 22% by adding this biomarker and tachycardia and syncope. So you could argue I'm a little overwhelmed here. We have so many different prognostic models. So until the new ESC guidelines come out, we should be using PESI score, which has been the most validated score system. We should be using the ESC guidelines, and we should be adding lactate and looking for a DVT because of the final study, which I didn't mention. And this is the, the, the fourth and last prognostic model, uh, which integrates um, troponin, BNP, presence of a DVT I mentioned, and a simplified Bessie score which is one or greater. And we found that the positive predictive value, so first of all those four metrics were independent predictors of worse outcome at 30 days, and conversely if your PESI score is normal and your BNP is normal, you had a negative predictive value of 99% for a complicated course. So here again, it's biomarkers, which we always get, looking for a, a, a DVT, which we should always be doing within the first 24 hours, and a simplified PESI score. So the new guidelines come out in 2018, and I suspect the authors will be recommending lactate and arterial lactate. There's no evidence yet 
on the utility of venous lactate versus arterial lactate, or indeed serial lactates, which one, as we do in sepsis, we should be following. As, um, but we'll wait for the 2018 guidelines and see if any of these new ideas are integrated. What about point of care ultrasound? I know in the pulmonary critical care division here and as um, internal medicine residents, you're increasingly using uh, point of care ultrasound and you're learning goal directed echocardiogram. So this is a paper from uh, our group downtown and uh, Jason Philippe is the first author uh, which came out uh, in December. And here it's looking at the uh, utility and the accuracy of our fellows doing a bedside echo soon after diagnosing a, a pulmonary embolism in a patient and seeing how their accuracy compares with what is our gold standard, a board certified cardiologist who will come in with the fellow or will read an echo performed by a fellow and give us the gold standard uh, result. Practically speaking, we all know, particularly in the middle of the night, it may be difficult to get a formal echocardiogram performed. So is a goal-directed echo a good substitute? We know from the critical care literature that our users of uh, goal-directed uh, um, ultrasound in the emergency room literature and the critical care literature has a fair degree, a very good degree of accuracy in patients in shock, respiratory failure, and for diagnosing DVT. So what was our experience here? So it's a single center perspective, retrospective review. Goal-directed echo was performed by all the fellows. Uh, five views were taken. Then those echoes were reviewed by our critical care attendings. And then were, in terms of accuracy, the gold standard was the echocardiogram performed, the results performed uh, and read by the cardiologist. Um, so this is how things should be. So this is a parasternal short axis view. The RV is usually triangular shaped and significantly smaller than the muscularized normal left ventricle here, um, where the ratio of the RV to LV should be less than 0.6. And this is somebody with uh, a moderately increased size of RV and somebody with a pulmonary embolism. So here's a continuum. These are apical four-chamber views, and this is somebody with a normal echocardiogram, a normal RV to LV ratio, right atrium, left atrium. Here is somebody with an RV that looks almost as big as the LV. This person's had an acute PE and they're in, in trouble and they have borderline blood pressure. And here we see somebody with McConnell sign, somebody with RV failure. And so, whereas the LV should be forming most of the apex of the heart, you see as the RV further dilates, the RV apex is forming the apex of the heart, um, contributing to it. And that's really the uh, the area of the heart that is moving most. So you have apical movement, but the free wall of the RV is not moving very well. This is McConnell's sign, and it's a bad prognostic sign in somebody with a pulmonary embolism and RV dysfunction. And this is uh, somebody showing, uh, again, with a high, a big RV, and this is a short axis, but what you see is, although you're missing some of the right ventricle, you can see how there's flattening of the uh, interventricular septum compared to that crescent shape we should see in somebody with a normal RV to LV dimensions. So let's look at the results. So in terms of uh, compared to the gold standard, uh, the formal echocardiogram performed by the cardiology fellow in attending, the sensitivity and specificity compared pretty, good, pretty well with the, uh, the formal gold standard with sensitivities of 83% and obviously superior sensitivity, is better diagnostic rate with the intensivist. Um, um, so what did we learn from this study? We learned that goal-directed echo, and I, we don't have time to dwell on the paper, performed by our fellows and intensivists has an acceptable accuracy. So timing is the important thing. This can be done in a well-trained fellow and, uh, and obviously a uh, well-trained supervisor within about five to 10 minutes and can be done 24-7. And we are limited by the availability of a formal echo as our gold standard treatment. One of the limitations of the study, only about 38% of patients had both goal-directed echo and a formal echo within 24 hours. So these patients were excluded. And the other thing, this should be recommended. If the fellow and, and attendings are well-versed and trained and skilled in goal-directed echo, which is certainly a focus here and, and downtown. <coughs> 
So here's a case, and I use this case as a platform to discuss the role of PE response team and discuss the possible management options in patients with incipient RV failure. So this is one of our early PROD cases, a 48-year-old woman with protein S deficiency. Now, how did she know she had that? Well, her mother had a PE in her 20s, and uh, she encouraged her kids when they got older to have a thrombophilia worker. And she took aspirin once a day, not evidence-based, but aspirin has a role to play, not necessarily for primary, but for secondary prophylaxis in patients had PE. And so you have that uh, baseline, and then she uh, took a flight from San Diego, uh, and then took to bed with an acute viral illness. Her history was benign otherwise, and her vital signs looked pretty good when she came in, normal tensive, no tachycardia, not hypoxic, and her exam was benign. But she soon, because of her thrombophilic story, and uh, because she was feeling short of breath, she was worked up for a pulmonary embolism, her biomarkers were elevated, and her CT scan showed bilateral PE, and she had RV dysfunction. Um, so this is a patient who's at intermediate high risk, elevated biomarkers, increasing RV. And she became unstable. As those results came in, she became tachycardic and her blood pressure began to fall. And um, it's not the best study, but showing increasing RV compared to LV ratio. And here's a central PE in the right and left main uh, pulmonary embolism. And here you will all agree. We're not radiologists, but the RV to LV ratio is greater than one, and as described, it puts her at a greater risk of mortality. So how should we treat her? Should we just give a full dose anticoagulation? Should we give her thrombolytics? She's not hypotensive, she has borderline blood pressure. Remember the BOVA index, which highlighted patients with borderline blood pressure at increasing risk? What about catheter-directed thrombolysis? Does that have a role to play in this patient? Should we send the patient to the OR for an open embolectomy? Uh, because we believe this patient at intermediate high risk is a risk of, of death. So the, the data, all of you could be right. The data supporting one or the other, uh, we don't have. And I'll highlight some of those studies. Um, and we'll get back to this case. And she received catheter-directed thrombolysis. And so I, I highlight this case to define the utility of a PE response team. So you have a PE response team for many years, and Human Champions at Human Poor, and we have one downtown, and we just uh, created one at Sinai West and uh, Mount Sinai St. Luke's. And so what is the rationale for having a PE response team? It's to provide an infrastructure where you have multidisciplinary specialists with an interest in PE to optimize and streamline the treatment of patients with a case just, just described, or somebody with a massive PE, because the role of these different therapies is not defined. And I should contrast it with the work you do, the stroke team, the trauma team, the ACS team. We all follow evidence-based guidelines. We don't have those guidelines, and that's why we need a multidisciplinary team to consider the risks and benefits of these different treatments. And the further reason to have a PE response team is to optimize disease awareness. I think by being available, I think we all benefit residents and attendings on increasing our sophistication, managing these patients. And obviously there's quality and safety benefits and looking at outcomes as a result of the management we did or did not perform. And cost containment, perhaps by having a streamlined appropriate use of facilities and resources, um, maybe providing value-based care and opportunities for research development. So I copied this from the PE Response Team Consortium. So we here are all members of the PE PERT Consortium, which is out of Mass General Hospital and was established two or three years ago. And so this slide is to show how chaotic things were before we had a PE response team. Perhaps they were not as chaotic as this, but the idea is referring hospital, patient comes in with a severe PE, we have all these multidisciplinary specialists, and the communication is somewhat haphazard. And there's no one contact person. Um, so here with the PE response team, here using, we use WhatsApp as an online, uh, as a method of you know, uh, real-time co communication. We can communicate with us, our colleagues, multidisciplinary specialists, so in real time we can compare the results of the echo, 
we review the biomarkers, we get input, we get an ongoing dialogue and eventually consensus on what is the best possible management. So as you have here, we devise our own PE response team algorithm and when we should call a PERT in patients in shock, with a clot in transit, a patients at intermediate high risk. And note that we have integrated heart rate, blood pressure, lactate, biomarkers, ultrasound, and echo, based on what we know and those newer models to risk stratify. And one of the advantages of the P response team is opportunities for QI initiatives. Um, in terms of process of care, the PERT consortium recommends that from the calling of the PERT, the initiation of definitive treatment should be less than 90 minutes. So that's a metric that we try to adhere to. And when we review PERT cases every month, we see if we're sort of meeting that uh, metric. Um, one thing to emphasize here, the peer response team is not just about in-hospital patient management, but the management of that patient continues after discharge. There are many questions that remain unanswered. How long, so first of all, we have to find a home for these patients and manage them on the anticoagulants we have chosen. How long should we treat them? That's determined by the etiology. And the patient may need a thrombophilia evaluation. Should the patient have age-appropriate cancer screening in those who have an idiopathic spontaneous clot? We need to look at 30 and 90-day outcomes. And we're going to be establishing VTE clinics throughout all the centers in Manhattan, and hopefully a VTE clinic uh, at the Respiratory Institute uh, with an interest in pulmonary vascular disease. And we should be looking for CTEP, which affects at least 3.8% of patients with a PE. Um, this is a recent article from Mass General, who are the originators of the PERT team, and it was a retrospective view of how far they have come. Now, be <coughs> noting that the PERT is called for every PE. Uh, here, and it's only downtown, whereas we see every PE patient, the PERT team only sees those at intermediate and high risk. And so they reviewed outcomes. And what is interesting here, and that's why I want to show you this slide, so the PE response team activations increased about 15 to 16 percent every six months. And I think this is one of the advantages of having a PERT, um, is that clinicians, our colleagues, become aware of a service that we could provide. The, the actual, uh, the sources of these calls, they mainly come from the emergency room and medical floors and the ICU, so that hasn't changed. Um, and the proportion of patients who have low, submassive, or massive PE is not changing as well. Just more PERTs are being activated at Mass General. So what is, uh, how does the literature guide us on what, uh, how these patients should be managed with submassive and massive PE? Firstly, thrombolytics. So a recent meta-analysis by Chatterjee, who was at St. Luke's in 2014, did a meta-analysis of 14 studies describing the utility of thrombolytics uh, and the primary outcomes of mortality and bleeding. And this is essentially the problem we have with thrombolytics. We have a paucity of data. These are 16 trials from 1970 to 2014, encompassing about 2,800 patients. So if you compare that literature with the cardiac literature, where you have tens of thousands of patients, where we have reports of experience on the safety and efficacy of thrombolytics, this is one of the problems we have in defining what, is the, uh, what does the literature tell us about using thrombolytics in terms of safety and efficacy. So over 50 years almost, from urokinase to streptokinase to TPA to nectoplase, um, 14 different, 16 different studies. And we know in meta-analysis at least, because there's no one paper which shows, which is powered sufficiently to show mortality benefit of thrombolytics. But in totality, the all-cause mortality will be, is reduced in patients with submassive and massive P who get thrombolytics with a cost of increasing risk of intracranial hemorrhage and particularly increasing risk of bleeding in those aged 65. If you do a subgroup analysis, excuse me, just look at intermediate risk pulmonary emboli, you see that there seems to be a benefit. Um, and that was a platform, well, that was not a platform, but in that context, Many of my colleagues are very familiar with this study. This is the best and possibly the last study that will be done looking at the possible utility and safety of giving full-dose thrombolytics in patients who are at intermediate risk. And it was a negative study. 
whereas the primary outcome was a composite of death and hemodynamic deterioration, there was no mortality benefit. So one should not be giving thrombolytics if you're, if you're expecting a mortality benefit in somebody with RV dysfunction. And moreover, in terms of safety, about 2.4% of these patients who were given full-dose thrombolytics had a stroke, and most of them were catastrophic intracranial hemorrhage, or potentially catastrophic. So I think, but when one looks at this study, we ask, is there a role for low-dose thrombolysis? The literature is not comprehensive. There's one often quoted study looking at half-dose thrombolytics, 50 milligrams TPA, in a single center study. And, but I'll be talking now about catheter-directed thrombolysis. So catheter-directed thrombolysis is increasing the use of patients like the one I just described for patients with both submassive and massive PE. In a review article in 2009 from Quo, looking at 594 patients with massive PE, CDT, catheter-directed thrombolysis, was associated with a 86% survival. What about our patients with submassive PE? So the beauty of catheter-directed uh, thrombolytics and is that one uses a low dose compared to 100 milligrams full dose parenteral, side directed local one to two milligrams an hour over 18 to 24 hours. There's certain uh, eligibility criteria, the PE has to be proximal. The effect is that we know from uh, right heart cath that instilling the low dose thrombolytics will decrease the polymer resistance, improve cardiac output, but it's not without potential complications. There are many methods. In the old days, they used a, an angioplasty a catheter to fragment the clot. And this is a mechanical device where you're essentially uh, whipping the catheter and it fragments the clot. And this is a, an ultrasound associated thrombolytic device, which I'll go into. And here's a before and after. This is a patient with a massive bilateral PE. And the arrows point to the, uh, the obstruction and the profound oligema, particularly of the right lung. Um, and the, perhaps the left lower lobe. And uh, this is a repeat pulmonary angiogram performed after um, mechanical uh, thrombectomy with restoration of certainly significant improvement in the blood flow to the right lung. And ultrasound assisted therapy is uh, one of the tools one can use. We don't use it here for reasons I'll get into, appropriate reasons. But here you have not only do you have a catheter through which you instill thrombolytics, and here's one catheter in the right main, here's one catheter in the left main, but the arrows pointing to these little boxes, which are transducers attached to the machine here, which emits ultrasound energy, which helps mechanically fragment the clot. And again, you use low dose. So what is the evidence supporting catheter-directed thrombolysis? This is the only study I'm showing you now, very briefly, which compared catheter-directed thrombolysis with low dose thrombolytics with unfractionated heparin. And we know at 24 hours, the RV-LV ratio is improved. Um, and we know that by 18 hours, the right heart cath shows that the PA systolic with catheter-directed thrombolytics falls from 52 to 39, uh, the mean pressure from 30 to 24. So two larger studies describing experience with catheter-directed thrombolytics includes this study, the Seattle 2 study. Again, it's a single arm multicenter trial, 150 patients. They had all had RV dysfunction. And note that 80% had submassive, like our patient, 20% had massive pulmonary emboli. And in all patients, a significant reduction in the RV LV diameter ratio and the PA systolic pressure from a mean of 51 to 37. Major bleeding about 9%. And, and finally, the perfect study. Uh, uh, an apt acronym perhaps for, or maybe not, uh, 101 patients, 28 had massive PE, 73 had submassive. And they compared ultrasound assisted, that device I showed you versus what we use here. And you'll see that both were equally efficacious. And the endpoints were stabilization or improvement in hemodynamics. Um, interestingly enough, two thirds of these patients had a filter place, in hospital death was 6%. And you see that whether you used ultrasound assisted or the standard catheter directed thrombolysis, they were equally efficacious in reducing the PA systolic pressure within 24, 48 hours, uh, with total dose of TPA about a quarter to a third of what we normally use. So there are no randomized control studies. These are single arm studies apart from the first one. 
And that's why in, when we're scratching our heads, when we're discussing a case as a member of the PERT team, we consider the potential risks and benefits. Can we use CDT in patients who had a recent surgery? Can we use CDT in a pregnant woman who's postpartum with a massive PE, who's hemodynamically on the threshold of going into hemodynamic collapse? We don't have these answers. I showed you in the PETHO study that both thrombolytics did not improve mortality and there was increased risk of bleeding, and hence the use of low-dose thrombolytics with catheter. We're interested in that. What about in the elderly? What is the experience of using catheter-directed thrombolytics? Naturally, we see a lot of elderly patients who have pulmonary emboli who may have borderline blood pressure. What is the safety of this modality? And so this is a subgroup analysis of the Seattle 2 study I just showed you. Um, and it looked at safety and efficacy, and they're about an equal, in those age 65 and those aged under 65, about 80% in each group had submassive, and about 20% had massive pulmonary emboli. But the good news is that not only did the hemodynamics improve in those under 65, over 65 and under 65, um, but bleeding complications were comparable. There was a trend suggesting increased bleeding in age 65, but it did not achieve statistical significance based on these numbers, 62 and 88, respectively, in those patient groups who received uh, low-dose thrombolytics. So that's really the extent of the literature so far in, on catheter-directed thrombolysis. Let's talk about ECMO. So these days we end pulmonary critical care talks by talking about gene therapy or ECMO. When the audience is beginning to fall asleep, they suddenly become reinvigorated when we mention ECMO. And I know here you do out an ECMO service. And uh, first of all, who should be considered an ECMO candidate who has a pulmonary embolism? So we're looking at patients with massive PE, and we define massive PE are those patients who are hypotensive for at least 15 minutes who require presses. And it, as I mentioned, it can account for a mortality of 5 to 10 percent. And these patients die of RV failure and shock. Now note that the ACCP guidelines, the most recent from 2016, did not even mention ECMO as a potential modality for managing patients with massive PE. The ESC guidelines two years previously did mention ECHO as a modality for hemodynamic support in PE, perhaps facilitating an open embolectomy. As pulmonologists, we know that ECMO is not new. It was first described in the 1970s for patients with severe respiratory failure, ARDS. But it did not uh, reach um, prominence until recently, largely because of technical issues, problems with the gas exchanger, the cannula-related bleeding, and pump design. So what is ECMO? What is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation? It, uh, the patient's oxygenation is improved and CO2 is eliminated through an extracorporeal circuit, I'll show you. And here, for, with respect to pulmonary embolism patients, we're talking about VA ECMO, where a catheter emerges from a femoral vein. If necessary, uh, with VA ECMO, presses can be given to the patient, and a pump is used to encourage flow from the femoral vein to this um, membrane oxygenator where gas and blood are separated by a semi-permeable membrane. The amount of oxygenation that occurs is a function of how much oxygen is given, the properties of the membrane and the flow derived from the pump. And then the efferent lymph is that oxygenated blood in an extracorporeal fashion is then returned to the patient, usually in the femoral artery. So one of the advantages of this circuit is you can pro provide presses. So unlike cardio, uh, uh, bypass surgery, where you're providing um, support for a short period of time, ECMO can provide hemodynamic support and gas exchange for, for weeks, sometimes longer, and has been used as a bridge to heart and or lung transplant. So what, are the, what does the literature say are the indications for ECMO and acute PE? Cardiac arrest? patients in shock who have not arrested, contraindications to thrombolysis, failed thrombolysis, failed CDT, uh, patient unable to have CDT, profound hypoxemia. What are the complications? Bleeding at least one third of patients, that has improved. Uh, uh, Dr. Brody, who gave his grand rounds at Columbia, who's pioneered a really first-rate ECMO team, you know, he's more judicious in the anticoagulation target, PTT, about 1.5 times control, and using smaller cannulae, we are seeing less bleeding, but patients are at risk of HIT, uh, 
to use unfractured heparin. Platelet aggregates form the plastic tubing in the extracorporeal circuit. Those aggregates are then sequestered by the spleen. The patient becomes thrombocytopenic. Intracranial hemorrhage and pulmonary hemorrhage are described pulmonary hemorrhage, so with a terrible prognosis. If the efferent limb goes in a limb, and it often does, you can cause ischemia. You could lose a limb. And the risk of stroke and uh, perforation hemorrhage is by, uh, from the cannula. So uh, last month, there was a study in resuscitation. We don't have much literature on the role of ECMO, but this is from last month. Uh, one center described their experience in 32 patients with PE who, who received ECMO. About two-thirds survived to decannulation. Remember, these patients are at the edge of death or may have died. Indeed, ECMO may be applied during cardiac compression and CPR, and 53% survived the index hospitalization. So what were the adverse prognostic variables? Not surprisingly, if you have a cardiac arrest prior to ECMO, it was associated with worse outcome. And that has been well described in the literature, where the survival is less than 10%. If, you fail thromb if you've been given thrombolytics, it's associated with worse outcome. And maybe that's just a marker of severity on presentation. And the elevated lactate, not surprisingly, is associated with worse outcome. Good prognostic signs, if the lactate is lower than six, and the patient has had CDT. ECMO is an expensive procedure, time intensive, a lot of multiple resources. We have to use it judiciously and safely. So here's an example of a case where we used ECMO. Uh, we sent the patient here. This is a 24-year-old woman in perfect health, and she had a spontaneous leg pain and the day she went to one of our local emergency rooms, a different system was diagnosed with a DVT, and apparently she had a point of care ultrasound, and apparently her RV looked okay. I don't know if she had any biomarkers. She got one dose of Lovenox and was sent home with Xarelto. So not very standard of care. Six hours later, she presents to Beth Israel emergency room in shock. She's hypoxemic, an altered mental state. It's an expression of poor perfusion, low cardiac output. She has a dilated RV, a biomarkers, PERT is activated. She's given TPA in the emergency room. She's being resuscitated. She remains hypotensive. She's intubated. She's on lever fed. Uh, the echo shows a big RV, a McConnell sign. For a short period of time, when the O2 sats are in the 80s on mechanical ventilation, she has a CT angiogram. She has bilateral PE. We call Mount Sinai at 7:11 a.m. The team come down. They put the cannula in and uh, she's whisked off to Sinai. Uh, this is the central pulmonary embolism. She had a saddle embolism, and uh, she survived. And I think without ECMO, she probably would have died. Um, so these are the ugly looking clots, some new, some a little old, uh, that were removed during embolectomy, facilitated by ECMO. This is another role of ECMO. You can stabilize the patient to facilitate open embolectomy or even catheter-directed thrombolysis. ECMO was weaned, you stop the extracorporeal circuit, and then the patient's uh, weaned from the ventilator. There was a rent in the femoral artery that was repaired. The patient was, uh, went home eventually, and has gone to rehab. Um, this is another case, which I use as an example of why, when we can consider doing embolectomy. This is a 48-year-old male who had some chronic dyspnea and acute and chronic dyspnea after returning from a trip to Peru. On admission, his vital signs were stable, and his, indeed his biomarkers looked fine. But because he was short of breath, and because he'd been on a long flight, he had a CT angiogram, which showed a saddle PE, RV strain, his echo showed a uh, pulmonary hypertension, a big RA and big RV, and a right atrial thrombus. And those of you who know that a clot in transit, right atrial thrombus, is a marker of worse, severity, uh, worse outcome, and it's probably an expression of large clot burden, because if you think about it, everybody has a clot, with a PE has a clot in transit. But we rarely see it because the clot burden is small, and it, we see manifestations of that embolism in the pulmonary vasculature. Um, with increasing use of point-of-care ultrasound, we're seeing it more. And, uh, but it has prognostic significance. There's no consensus on what is the optimal treatment, but we know anticoagulation alone is, is inadequate and many papers describe thrombolytics or even embolectomy with improvement. Uh, and this is the echo and you, this apical four chamber. And do you see this? It's been described as serpiginous, snake-like. This is a clot going from the right atrium 
the right ventricle. And in a recent patient we had, which is probably a tumor clot and thrombus, that actually came here as well, um, there was almost occlusion of the tricuspid valve, and the patient was hypotensive. So because of this, this patient went to the OR. Uh, this is the saddle embolism. And, uh, okay, <laughs> maybe a pulmonary embolism. So. And this is a TEE performed in the OR. So uh, here's the clot in transit, going from the right atrium to right ventricle. And this is the clot that was removed. And equally importantly, the patient had a, uh, a PFO. Remember, 20% of us are at risk of uh, opening of the PFO. And uh, the PFO was closed at the same time to prevent a paradoxical embolism. And this was done at our hospital, that repair. And what is the role of surgical embolectomy? And this is a recent paper from the Brigham and Goldhaber's group. And it's a retrospective consecutive series of 115 patients. And the reason why I want to show it to you is because a significant number of these patients, approximately 50%, were hemodynamically stable. At the beginning, we talked about the, the necessity of perhaps using more refined prognostic models to determine who is at risk of RV uh, failure and clinical deterioration. So most of the patients who were receiving embolectomy were post-op patients. So these are patients who have at least relative contraindications of full-dose thrombolytics. These are orthopedic patients, neurosurgery patients, presenting about 18 days after surgery, general surgery patients, uh, GYN patients. And about 48% had submassive PE. So what I'm talking about, an open embolectomy in somebody with a submassive PE. Um, you may think that's over-aggressive, but if you look at the outcomes, the, o the operative mortality was a total of 8%, 5% in massive PE, and 2% in submassive PE. So that's extraordinary. Now, these are consecutive, and I have to admit, most of these patients probably received embolectomy prior to cardiac arrest, not after cardiac arrest. But this is a, 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 a center with a great experience and a safety record of doing embolectomies, and it may be instructive. So the, uh, there may be a role for open embolectomy in patients with submassive P with contraindications to cath-directed thrombolysis. Uh, and I think, in the interest of time, I'd be happy to receive questions. So the focus of my talk, uh, I began by talking about the epidemiology, the increasing instance of VTE, particularly in the aging population, the dile dilemmas associated with defining the patient at risk of RV failure and hemodynamic collapse who presents in a hemodynamically stable fashion. I showed you the evidence supporting the, uh, the utility of thrombolytics, catheter-directed thrombolytics, embolectomy, and ECMO. And uh, I talked about the necessity, I think, of, as a, of a full-service hospital having a PE response team where a multidisciplinary team can be harnessed to ans help best answer the questions of how we should manage these patients. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, David, thank you. Um, given that the data is kind of mixed for submassive PE and the benefits of just traditional care, thrombolysis, open embolectomy, how much do you involve the patient in the decision making in terms of discussing data and their options? Well, you're quite right. We involve the patient first, and sometimes the patient is perplexed because they may be, so whereas there's a primary attending who ultimately has the final decision, and hopefully there's a consensus, it's that primary attending, usually a critical care doctor, who one-on-one -on -one with the patient and his or her family explaining the potential options and potential risks. And most of us here are not sure what will be the right treatment. And there may be a local bias. We have to be aware of what we have in our facilities here as we have downtown. We have a first-rate IR service. We have first-rate cardiothoracic surgeons. So I don't hesitate in recommending one or the other based on our own experience, safety experience here, and uh, if if that's a theoretical option. But as you say, the literature does not give a, it provides signposts, but no answers. Yeah. One more question for me. The uh, possibility of uh, randomized controlled trials was impressive through your presentation. So is it considered by uh, uh, various people 
that there is a contraindication to a randomized control trial, or do you accept that some of the uh, studies with single arms give you uh, potential ways, and which, which uh, control arm would you use if you're going to use a control arm? Well, you know, Andrew is here, but I think the single arm studies provide the following benefit. They show a pretty impressive safety record in patients objectively characterized using validated score systems. So the literature, you know, uh, what we have, it, it comforts us in, in, in reassuring us that the safety record of these more advanced therapies is pretty good. Now, the skeptics amongst us would request that we have randomized controlled studies. Indeed, most of the time, patients with RV dysfunction do well. I think the answer is the use of more refined prediction tools to help better define that patient's at highest risk using lactate looking for a DVT um, may help guide what we should be doing. But in the absence of those randomized control studies, you know, um, our uh, management decisions are at best informed by uh, literature which really is still developing. Um, if I was to devise a randomized control study, well, we should have an unfractionated heparin arm because that's the standard therapy for even unstable patients with the opportunity to advance therapy if the patient deteriorates. Should we be waiting for that patient to advance or should we be using prediction tools to intervene and uh, abort the unfraction heparin and, and use advanced therapy. I mean, that's the questions we are faced with. Great. Let's thank Dr. Stein.